Now I'd like to introduce your speaker. He's kind of special to me because he's one of my doctors. Dr. Mario Spajari practices in the Division of Transplantation at UI Health. He has extensive experience in liver, kidney, pancreas, and intestinal transplantation, in addition to hepato uh, hepatobiliary <laughs> and pancreatic surgery. He has completed both an ASTS multi-organ transplantation and hepato hepatobiliary fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic and an Islet and Pancreas Transplantation Fellowship at UI Health. Dr. Spijari has been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, presented his work at national and international meetings, and he has co-authored several chapters in surgical textbooks. And we are so honored that he would take his time and be with us here today. Please welcome Dr. Spijari. Thank you, everybody. So today I'm going to talk about, you know, a little bit of a different topics to me. It's not about like numbers, clinics, uh, transplant surgery outcome, but a little bit of a different, a different issue. So as a surgeon, so every time, I mean, my main focus when I do a transplant has always been, you know, to see my patient live in the hospital with a functioning organ with a functioning kidney, liver, pancreas, but is that all? I mean, uh, that's, can you hear me better? So we started asking, uh, asking ourselves this question, this, is, uh, this should be our only focus, so our surgical outcomes, and of course the answer is no. So then we started seeing transplantation more uh, as a journey, instead of being like a surgical procedure. And uh, we started realizing that our patient, liver, kidney, everybody, actually before the transplantation, before the transplant happened, have been dealing with uh, chronic disease for many, many years. This chronic, chronic disease, of course, is associated with many challenges. And uh, these challenges, they don't go away overnight after a successful transplant and actually can bite our patient back after the transplant. So this is how everything started. So, and then going back to my presentation, well, I'm just gonna give you a couple of comments, the rationale of wh why we started doing that and some results of our study. However, I have three videos that I definitely want to show you because I think this is the core of the presentation. So in the first one, you're gonna see people that I'm pretty sure you're gonna recognize as like testimonials of what we are doing. But in the second and third video, you're gonna see two superstars that actually are our patient. Okay, so let me, let me start. Okay, so aging. Aging, as we know, is associated with physical impairment and sometimes with disability. This is a phy physiologic process. And the reason for this, as you can see in this sectional image, is that with time, we lose muscles. We lose lean mass. That is like the engine of our body. So when the, when the muscle and the lean mass and the strand that of course is associated goes below a certain level, unfortunately we can face disabilities. And chronic condition like chronic kidney disease actually increase dramatically the risk of developing a disability, a physical disability. There are many publications about, about that on this topic, about pure musculoskeletal health and the risk of mortality in different fields, not only kidney transplantation. But kidney transplantation is one of the main topics, as you can see from this slide. So about 20% of the kidney population is considered frail. So frailty syndrome is a well-known syndrome these days and can be actually assessed by some physical test that I will show you later. So frailty, it's not only about feeling weak. Actually, it's a real risk factor for mortality after kidney transplantation. 
frail people have about five-fold higher risk of mortality at one year and similar, definitely higher risk of mortality at five years. And uh, that's why we decided to start with the GH program. So let me explain you a little bit what GH is. So GH Fit Lab is a group of professional trainer that develop a very special system. They are very good in what they are doing, so they help for the pain, but they give, they give people motivation. So basically the, their goal is to change the patient mindset and motivation, so basically from an external drive to an internal drive. So they will support you at the beginning, and then you're going to be the one Able, able to take care of yourself, pretty much. And then I'm going to show you the first video. <coughs> this has to be implemented by the organization. You know, everybody has to see what the value is. And the only way that they're going to see what the value is, is to have people in the program and then come back and tell them, hey, this is fantastic. This is really helping me. Since I retired 20 some years ago, I've been searching for something to replace that, that effort, that workout of, of football. This workout has revolutionized the way I think about my body and moving forward. The excitement that I feel every time I come into GH Fit Lab, it's been outstanding because it's not only the concepts, it's the belief, it's, it's that focus and that focus that the intensity, you know, which we use in football. Because for so long we were talking about explosive exercise, lifting as much weight as you could and doing damage in the meantime to the muscles, not repairing the muscles. And that's the whole idea of what we do here is actually you're building the muscle slowly, but you're also repairing it. It does, it literally pumps the blood through your system and makes your body start to repair and, and heal. And you can feel that. You know, it took a couple of weeks, I think, of me just going, what is, this? what is this? Then you start, you know, pain starts subsiding. I love the concept of building muscle around pain spots. You get these weak spots, build the muscle around it, and then all of a sudden the pain goes away. I've not seen anybody doing this type of work. This helps me uh, with my golf because it gives me flexibility and it gives me strength. And that's what you need for golf. And the whole idea of, of someone actually taking you through and with a clear understanding of where you're trying to go and what you're trying to do uh, and, and what ails you, more importantly, how to get that better. Uh, you know, it's not every problem is going to be solved here. But I tell you one thing, a lot of them can be helped here and my muscle has become medicine for my body. I understand about connecting my muscles. I understand about when I, uh, when I work out one muscle and getting that muscle to its maximum potential. I wish I would have had this 25 years ago. And if I had it 25 years ago, I'd be in better shape than I am today. And I'm not in bad shape today. What we've been trying to do here at GH Fit Lab has worked for me. The feeling has returned to my shins and my, my ankles and my feet. Uh, the shoulder is, uh, is, it's been magnificent. My pain level's gone way down and when I do the exercises now. And it's more weight, so I mean, stronger, but less pain, which is the whole idea. Be able to play golf, be able to play baseball again, catch six and seven innings and feel healthy and feel happy and get up and, and my body doesn't ache. I'm feeling refreshed, I'm feeling strong and I can feel my body regenerating, and that's an awesome feeling. I want to take it all the way out to the end, whatever the end is, I want to be in the best shape I can be in because I think that'll let me have a better quality life. I can play for time now because I've got three grandchildren, and I want to be sure that I'm around for them too, so I can enjoy them. They might not necessarily enjoy me, but I want to be around and enjoy them. It's been a lifesaver. It's been great. I'm thankful for it. If you're an ex-athlete or, or uh, even anybody, and, and, and you want to get your, I think your body in the best shape you can get in, you, you got to try this program. Okay, so I continue 
to the present with the presentation. So this is our first study. Okay, so our first study was about uh, kidney post kidney transplant recipient. So we included in the study so people from 18 to 65 year old status post kidney transplantation with a functioning organ and uh, with an adequate cognitive ability to complete the questionnaires, so the final assessment, and uh, with some physical capacity that of course allowed them to perform the exercises. So this is uh, how the exercise is structured. So basically from week zero to week, uh, to week eight, so we do some exercise education, so some uh, motion, uh, motion, range of motion exercise, and basically teaching what the program is going to be. Then from week nine to 20, so we increase the muscular endurance, so low weight, higher repetition. And from week 21 to 52, so we increase the strength and uh, we incorporate, of course, some, uh, they incorporate actually some uh, endurance exercise. And uh, these are the results. So we enroll 144 a patient. We randomize in a two, two to one ratio. So two people to the exercise, one person to the control group. So 59 person dropped from the study, mainly from logistic, logistic reason. We have to perform the exercise at our facility. So for some people, unfortunately, it was not easy to, to come and, and go back twice a week. So 85 person completed the program. So the goal of the study, despite of course assess the well-being, physical strength and so forth, was actually mainly to assess the ability to find an employment or keep the job or return to school because these are the two most important metrics of well-being in the society. And um, these are the, the results. So 41 people participated in the study with a two day per week program and 25, 25 person was, were enrolled in the control group. So they were tested at baseline six months and 12 months. And uh, this is the total exercise capacity progress for our exercise group. As you can see, the strength of these people, of course, uh, in one year increased dramatically. And we have a way, like a scientific way, to assess actually the strength. And then you can see that comparing the exercise group to the control group, well, there is a statistical significance difference here. And talking about the lean mass, that is the most important, uh, the most important portion on our body, of our body composition, well, here what you can see is that it didn't change significantly in the exercise group, but unfortunately what happened is that it, progress, it progressively declined in the control group. So this means that these people, despite the functioning kidney, they weren't getting stronger, actually the opposite. And this is the bone mineral content. So, you know, uh, we are talking about the risk of developing osteoporosis and spontaneous fracture here. And here, as you can see, the exercise group has an increase in the bone density. Of course, I mean, this is an important protective factor for osteoporosis. And this is the level of pain. All these uh, pain, uh, um, depression uh, and uh, all these factors have been assessed through questionnaire. So the level of pain, it decreased significantly. The mental health, so assessed by this questionnaire, actually significantly improved in our population. And uh, so this is the answer to our main question, employment. So out of 41 patients, we had 20 patients that were unemployed at the time of the transplant. Of those, 15 actually found a job. So 75%. Seven patients were retired, and 14 patients were employed, or they were at school at the time of transplant, and so 10 kept their job. Two went from a part to a full-time job, and one lost his job, but actually enrolled in school. 
In the control group, unfortunately, these results are not as promising because of, out of 14 unemployed patients, only two found a job, so only a 14% increase. And this is the difference that you can clearly see here. So we have a 75% of our patient unemployed that actually found a job in the exercise group versus a 14%. So why is so important employment after a transplant? Well, it's very important because again, so having a functioning organ doesn't mean that you are doing well, that you are feeling well. So what happened is that 60 to 70% of kidney transplant recipients after the transplant, they feel, they still feel disabled. They don't feel that they can rejoin after many years of dialysis and chronic kidney problem, they can rejoin the society, but actually they can. And now I'll show you another video, this is a superstar. When Ron first started the GH study, he was not only recovering from transplant surgery, but he also had chronic type 2 diabetes, which caused his neuropathy, severe numbness and weakness in his legs and feet. In addition to his neuropathy, Ron had chronic knee pain and at the young age of 39, was unable to walk without his braces and a cane. He was overweight, exhausted, and sleeping on average 14 hours a day. Despite being a hard worker all his life, Ron lost his job while on dialysis, and he had to rely on disability support for eight years with no hope for a better life. Ron also had a few setbacks in the program. Over the course of the year, he was hospitalized for fluid retention and infections. Yet despite all that, he continued to follow the GH study protocol and showed great improvement. I basically noticed my energy increasing a little bit more you know, week after week, I've started noticing my legs starting to get stronger, pretty much walking without the cane now. It has been 11 months into the program, and Ron has gone through an amazing transformation. His focus and commitment is inspiring to all of us. He also has some great news to share. 11 months into the study, I was able to gain employment as a bus driver. <laughs> As a bus driver, uh, transport students to school safely. As of now, it feels, it feels wonderful to be working uh, at this point in time after eight years of not working. I feel great, you know, greater than I ever have. I never thought in a million years that I would be, be sitting here to tell you this, but you know, basically, uh, all things are possible. Okay, so thrilled by the results of our first study, so we decided to offer the same uh, exercise program to patients on chronic dialysis, so not, not transplanted yet. So we did a pilot study with 10 patients on chronic hemodialysis, and uh, we had the preliminary results. These are the preliminary results, so here, the higher is the number, the, the lower is the level of pain. So the level of pain significantly decreased for this patient population. And let me just make a point. So one of the common things in dialysis, it's called protein wasting syndrome. So for some reason that is actually not very well understood, people tend to lose lean muscle. Okay, so lean muscle is protective for cardiovascular event. And unfortunately, dialysis itself is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So it's very important to keep your muscle and the level of activity high at, during dialysis, even if it's very difficult. And uh, so this is the level of energy that increased and the physical function that increased as well in those 10 patients. And uh, as a result, uh, the degree of depression in this population is significantly decreased. It's decreased, but not significantly. It's from a statistical standpoint. So how we assess the frailty? So frailty is assessed uh, through three very simple tests. One is called hand grip strength, that as you can see has improved over time. 
The other is the sit to stand time. So how many times the patient can squat out of a chair and uh, definitely improved. And this is the eight foot walk time that of course it's self-explanatory and definitely improved. So the next video probably it's, uh, it's probably my favorite one. And uh, after this video, I will be happy to answer any question. Thank you. Kidney failure has taken my left eyesight. In 2014, I had a cerebral vascular accident, which is a stroke. I had a stroke. I now have poor use of my left leg. So I have to, um, I'm tied to a walker now and it got to a point I can't hardly walk anymore. I have to now sit in my walker and use like a wheelchair 90% of the time. When, when you've been on dialysis for nine years and every time you wake up, you feel something else is breaking down in your body. For example, the eyesight, then the stroke, and then this happens and that happens. No matter what the case is, you feel that you're dying physically and mentally. I look back on it now and I see that I'm not even the same person I was six months ago. I'm able to walk on two feet with my cane. As before, just I would run around in a walker. And now not to have any pain in my legs, no pain in my ankles or feet or pain in my, my thighs, no pain whatsoever. It's been a miracle. So I'm able to get on the machines, able to do different uh, types of uh, exercises now that I haven't been able to do before. Even be able to stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down multiple times is, is a shocking. And I enjoyed it, you know. I felt I had so much more energy. I felt so much more excited. I was like, I feel good, you know, I can, I can do this, you know. But no, it was, it was very, it was very exciting to see my body do that. I wasn't able to do that before. It would just stand up on my own. My mental state is so much more, so much more healthier now than in times past. I'm not sad, I don't feel everything is gloom and doom. What was me feeling? I care about myself now. I care about others around me. You know, I love life. You know, I, I want to smell the flowers. I want to experience things. You know, I can't wait to take my kids to Disney World now and have fun with them without, hopefully one day without being on dialysis, I'll be stuck in this year. You know, but at least I got freedom of movement now, so I can take them different places now. I feel that my life is, is taking off. I was getting healthier. My body was responding to the, the muscle therapy. I was able to walk. Um, my numbers were looking good. Now there is light at the end of the tunnel. I'm on the transplant list now. And any day now, in fact, I could be sitting here right now while I'm doing this interview. I get a call. Hey, come on over now and get the kid. Thank you. Any question? Questions? <laughs> okay, so I think actually you can get all the con. Yeah. There you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. You are fifty six, you said. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I've been on dialysis for uh, 16 years. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I, I feel good. It's just I, um, I had fell off the bus back in 2015. That's why I have to. I, I used to only use my walk on dialysis days. Mm -hmm. 
But after I fell off the bus, I had, you know, my body started getting worse. Because the doctor told me I would eventually, you know, when I get older, older, probably in my 60s, I guess, I'll end up in a, um, he said, you know, power, you know, wheelchair. And, uh, but as far as dialysis, sometimes I'm sleepy. But I do a lot, a little sleeping at night. And then when I get in the chair, you know, it's, that make it a full day. But then sometimes I do feel tired and end up going to bed, you know. Um, but um, I, I really want to try to see if I can make it to 15 years. Mm-hmm. And usually at a certain age, our bodies start deteriorating. Deteriorating, you know, when we're old, getting up real, like in our 60s. So I said, like this, well, if I can make it 15 years, you know, it's up to God, though. But if I make the 15 years, I'm just going to say glory to God, then anything else is extra. Really, when we turn 70, that's that's supposed to be the time when we're supposed to start passing. That's why our bodies start deteriorating, you know. But I want to get a kidney, but then sometimes I say, nah. But I, well, when I first started, though, dialysis, a nurse told me I could make it 30 years. But it's up to God when it comes down to it, because the kidneys might not take me out. It could be a freak accident, like when I fell off the bus. It could be anything that could cause it, you know, for me to, you know, pass. But I have faith in God to believe in that nurse and see if I, I want to do it, but then I don't. But then I think I'm going to give it a, a fighting chance because I'm 56. I'm going to give you my card and we're going to talk about it because you can get a transplant. All right. God has a kidney for you and it's coming. Okay. All right. Well. The only thing I can add to your another. story is okay. that, you know, you've been on the Yaris for 15 years. Uh, so, s- s- how long? 16, 16 years. 16 years. Mm-hmm. So, I cannot tell, I mean, again, so the, the, deciding about kidney transplant, of course, I mean, it's a very private decision. You need to talk, uh, first of all, with the transplant center. You need to go through an evaluation. But the good thing in your case is that you've been on the Yalis for such a long time that if, if you are cleared for kidney transplantation, you're going to get an offer the same day. And that's pretty incredible because unfortunately the problem of transplantation is the amount of people in need and the number of organs we have. So we have an average waiting time of four to six years, but now the time starts from the time you start the dialysis. Right. So the clock start ticking from there. So in your case, you're gonna jump at the top of the list. So think about it. Okay, what's your name? Talia? Okay. Okay, Talia, I look forward to hearing from you. Call me, and I'll walk you through this transplant process, okay? Terry, you have a question? Yes, Doctor. When will another key study be implemented? Will it be the first year or as opening curve for a participant to participate? I have had transplantation, as a matter of fact. I consulted with your... Uh, Associate Dr. Enrico Benedetti, yeah, regarding me taking pregnancy on after mm-hmm. the transplant, which put weight on me and gave effusion on my hips and my knees. But I would like to be a participant in the GH study. So, how did I possibly become a participant? And I was transplanted in Northwestern. Okay. Well, I think that in this, in I, I'm not sure when a new enrollment will start, but I need to talk with the research coordinator. So maybe what we can do, so if you send me an email, I will definitely put you in contact with her and she can have a bad, I don't want to give you an answer that is actually. Is that a problem, uh, send email to the mm-hmm. And she, yeah. Perfect. We'll do that, absolutely. No okay. problem. We'll do that, Terry. Thanks. Yep. Here you go. After the uh, letters GH were used in regard to the FIT lab, was that standing for growth hormone? 
<laughs> That's a very good question because you know what? So this was actually my first question when I, when I knew the program. No, the GH are the initials of, of the inventor of the system, of the, of the program. Yeah. The, uh, the uh, video was related to fragility as being a mortality risk, uh, but it occurs to me that exercise is a perfusion of kidney factor that was not addressed. How important was that in the recovery of patients? So two things. Of course, I mean, if you're talking about chronic kidney disease, unfortunately, at that regard, so the kidneys are gone. So people are on dialysis and those kidneys, they're, they're just completely shrunken. And talking about uh, the, second, the second point, so people who had a kidney transplant and join the GH study, you are actually, actually right. Because increasing the lean mass is going to increase the cardiac output. The cardiac output is basically the pump efficiency, is the results of the pump efficiency of our heart, and the results is the perfusion of the kidney. So that's actually a very good point to study in the long term. Actually, thank you for that. And that's something that we, we, we want to definitely look into it. Is this GH lab in Chicago or in some other location? Is in Chicago. So this, uh, so the studies done on the, with the patient, so dialysis and kidney transplant recipient are done at our facility at UI Health. So the GH group, it's a, it's a private group and they have like a three location, if I'm not wrong, three location, three location, I think two are in Chicago, one is in Bucktown, am I right? And there are two other locations in the suburbs, but the patient studies are run at our facility at UIC. And they are of course uh, absolutely free because these are covered by, you know, the clinical study this means by the fundraising to the university for this particular study. Okay. Did you have a question? Yeah. Um, well, I was down at U UI. I think I met you. I think so. I remember you, actually. You, admit, you, admit, you remember me? I know I remember you. And um, <laughs> there's a nurse there named Nurse Gray. And I was just trying to see if she's still there because... Uh, Grace, you, Grace, you said? Yeah, Grace. Grace. Yeah, she's there. Mm -hmm. And I was just trying to get back into the, I don't know why they haven't called me yet for um, some more blood work and stuff. They never called me back, so I don't know what's going on. Maybe I yeah. should call them. You, you have to call them. your coordinator. I called and they gave my name, and I asked for Nurse Grace, because she always tell me that. Okay. And um, I, I haven't gotten in touch with her. I mean, I can't reach her. I've been calling several times. Okay, so that's something definitely we need to we need to address. But I did remember meeting you, and you was telling yeah, me. Yeah, no, I remember. Uh, I I actually situation. remember situation. You were just telling me about the kidneys and all. Yeah, that, you know. So but that GH program, I would like to go into. So if she does, if she doesn't answer, but she should. If she doesn't answer, I try to call the the transplant clinic. Okay. So you can definitely mention that that you you talk with me and we'll address the we'll address the problem. I'm not sure honestly why this happened. Right, because I remember you were telling me about the kidneys and all of that. Yeah. You know. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much. And so what Dr. Spajari did not mention is not in the slides, but. I am one of the 75% of the patients that went through the program that got a job. 